I first came to the MBL, well, I first came to the MBL when I was probably six years old um, from the Woods Hole School where we would come down and take tours of the supply department. But also <clears throat> when I was, I don't know, maybe seven or eight, I, uh, my dad worked at Huey and one of his, or one of the postdocs there was a woman named Linda Graham and her husband Dave Graham ran one of the MBL boats and took me out star fishing one time where they put the um, they put this mop overboard and they basically mop the seafloor and the starfish get stuck to it because of their spines get stuck in the fabric and uh, so we went star fishing and I remember as a kid coming into the supply department and <clears throat> I put my hand in a tank and it must have had formalin or something in it because I burned, it burned and I didn't want to tell anybody. So I sort of like put it down and tried to wash it off without anybody seeing. But, but uh, so I had interactions when I was a kid and then either growing up and getting squid and stuff. My first um, professional uh, connection to MBL wasn't until I was an undergrad in college in 1984 <clears throat> when I worked in the supply department but I had been trying to get a job in the supply department for many years, but it was very competitive because uh, everybody wanted to work in the supply department because you got to catch fish and hang out on boats and stuff like that. So, uh, so I was, from 1984 and 1985, I was a diver, collector for the supply department. And then in 1991, I started working here, actually in this room, um, for the information systems division. And I was <clears throat> with the Information Systems Division, which was part of the library, until 2006. And then I moved overseas. And, and in 2012, I just moved back. And uh, I managed the Marine Resources Center, which is th what the supply department has become. Just the, the sound of like the water pouring, you go into the supply, it was always about Pretty much the supply department was the coolest place to go as a kid because it was sort of like a live you know an aquarium but you could kind of get your hands right on or near the animals and uh, and you know it wasn't like the MRC now it was much more of like this ramshackle old wooden house basically and um, just pipes all over the ceiling and and you know wooden countertops and everything and the floor was always wet in fact there was so much water on the floor coming out because it would just pour out of drains and out of buckets and stuff and just run across the floor. And then there were these sort of troughs that would catch the water and would go out into Eel Pond. And if you looked under some of the tanks and things that were on these frames, there would be like crabs and fla there would be flounder living in the, <laughs> in, the, in the troughs and there'd be crabs and things living under the tanks, you know, in the building, you know. <laughs> And so you never knew what you were going to find in there. <laughs> it was pretty funny. And uh, it just the pe and the people there were more, uh, you know, at the time they were much more uh, off the street New England fishing types. You know, they weren't people with degrees in animal husbandry or anything. They were more like the old timers with who knew where to go dig clams and the associated invertebrates with them and to ride the boats and you know to knew where to go to dredge and, you know, collect things. When I came back in after, after college, I mean, I, re I wanted to live back down here. And uh, in my background and my education was in, in marine science, marine biology, and I only got into the informatics sort of after the fact. And there was an opening at MBL in the library. And to me, the library was this sort of untapped, unexploited information resource, and you know, internet communications were only just really starting to take off a little bit. Well, even they weren't even taking off yet. I mean, when I arrived, there was no web or anything. It was all um, Unix-based shell scripts and telnetting to servers, and and then there was Gopher was this first system that preceded the web and so there was but but there were always things to do and there was so much material and I knew the biology 
that I was always engaged in trying to figure out how to get more information online. And, um, and so then when the web started picking up, um, we put out, in fact, MBL's website, which I you know, ran for many years, was one of the first, was definitely the first marine lab or anything like that in the country, uh, part of the world. Um, October of 94, I think our logs go back to. And, um, and once that started, then there was just all sorts of things. I mean, it was so new and kind of embryonic that th little things that we did that now are completely under the radar um, were, you know, we made the cover of science with a number of, I mean, with a, with, in association with others, but this, we put some online educational charts that used to, that are in the archives, they're called the Leuchart charts, and uh, just digitized the slides, put them online, and was on the cover of science as sort of, you know, things coming out on the web. And, um, and then as it matured, and I, I started to um, refine some of the information, then we got more into programming and learning web databases and things. So then I started putting more specimen information online and taking pictures of animals and making species pages, et cetera. So um, yeah, it was, so it wasn't really, I guess the more pertinent question for me wasn't what brought me here, but what, what kept me from leaving <laughs> And once I got here. And it was primarily because there were always new challenges um, with informatics. There was just more and more to learn. And then medical informatics, uh, the course came here, and I started kind of um, laterally transferring a lot of things I was learning from that course to what I could apply here. So the director of the NLM, the, of the National Library of Medicine, who hosts the, uh, the course, is this guy named Don Lindbergh. And he comes here twice a year, every year, to be part of the course. And, and if you go down to NLM, he's, you know, he's actually a pretty imposing figure. I mean, he's this big, tall, um, sure of himself, fairly you know, serious gentleman. And, uh, you know, and he knows his stuff. And so at the National Library of Medicine, it's, you know, which is this big rambling uh, um, camp, well, not a campus, it's part of the NIH campus, but it's quite a few buildings, and it's got NCBI, which is a big genomic and bioinformatics center, and he's in charge of it all. So he, but because he comes here to Woods Hole, and he's part of the course, we've gotten to know him, and Kathy Norton, who was my boss in the library, and I flew down to Washington for this inaugural kickoff uh, meeting for the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And while we were going down there, Dr. Lindbergh offered to take us out on his boat. So, uh, so we land and he picks us up at, uh, at National Air Reagan National Airport and, uh, and we drive for like three hours to his boat. It's, it's a long drive way down the coast of like Maryland, down the Potomac. But it's this long three hour drive, right? And then we get there, um, his wife was already there with their grandson, Martin, who we've known since he was like six months old. So me and Martin are messing around and we're chatting, we're waiting to, for the boat to fuel up, et cetera. And, uh, and the, the plan initially was, he would take us for a spin on the boat, then he would bring us back, he would drive us the three hours back, and then we would go to, to our meeting in Washington. So while we're, while we're sitting there, he says, you know, why don't I just bring you guys all the way up to Washington and just drop you off and then, you know, he'll be there. We don't have to come back and I don't have to drive you back. I said, great. So he tosses me his car keys and me and Martin go and get all our stuff and all the, out of the car, throw it in the boat and, and take off. And so we have this long leisurely afternoon going up the Potomac, you know, there's this place, there's that place, there's bald eagles catching things, there's fish jumping out of the, the river and uh, have a long, you know, a long ride. It's like, we spent like five hours on this boat this big kind of cabin cruiser -y kind of thing. And we come past Reagan National Airport and we're there's suddenly the city and he, we get dropped off in somewhere in Washington in this sort of very sh kind of upscale looking port part of town with bars and all these things right on the river. And so they throw us our bags and everything. And we say goodbye and they go puttering back. And now they've got this long ride go bang, going back down the river. So Kathy and I were staying at this place called the Cosmos Club, and uh, we were going to go there, change clothes, and go to this this par party, this barbecue. 
and we get checked in and I go into my room and I say, you know, I'm gonna take a shower before I, uh, before I go there. So I start taking all the stuff out of my pockets and I'm like, hear this, you know, when you pick your keys out of your pockets, you hear this jingling noise. So I'm like, what's that? That's, I don't know that noise. And I pick it and throw it on the bed and it's the Lindbergh's car keys. Don Lindbergh's the director of the National Lip Mighty Breed Medicine's car keys. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, he's gonna have this long four hour drive back to his boat, he's gonna get there, and he's not gonna have the keys, which means he's then somehow gotta get three hours back here to Washington to get the keys so he can drive three hours back to get his car so that he can drive three hours back to go to his house. Oh, so, and just, you know, it was just one of these moments where I was thinking, oh my gosh, this is not gonna end well. And, uh, and so, so I left. The, so we, I left the keys at the desk of the hotel, and uh, Kathy and I were at this party. And all of a sudden, Kathy's phone rings, and she looks at it. She says, "It's Don," and she just hands me the phone. <laughs> I had to, he's like, "You think you have my keys?" And I said, uh, "Yes, I have your keys." And in fact, he was fortunately they had another car there. His wife Mary's car were there, so they were able to land the boat, drive the three hours. They didn't have to like hitchhike the three hours to get back to Washington to get his car keys. But nonetheless, I was felt very on the spot and a little hot under the collar, like, oh boy. One day, I was sitting here in this office. I was supposed to be getting ready to go to a meeting at Huey, an informatics meeting. And uh, my wife called me and she said that she had been at Pie in the Sky and she had overheard some people talking that there was a great white shark trapped somewhere in Woods Hole nearby. I said, really? So, so, we fin so lunch came along and a whole bunch of us piled into an MBL boat and we went searching. And of course, once you get through the bridge, you know, we didn't really know where we would go. Well, we're, you know, so we kind of just drove around coasts for a while, went out, looked around, we figured we'd see a cluster of boats or something, couldn't see anything. And um, went into Hadley's Harbor, went around um, Nonamesset, over toward Nobska. Where would, you, where would a shark be stuck? And they were just about to come back when we were over in Lackey's Bay, and we saw some boats over, way inside the, the, the gutter that goes between Lackey's Bay and Hadley's Harbor, all those little channels that are back there saw some boats, so we said, let's go check it out. And sure enough, there was one other boat there um, with a guy from MBL, La Adam Lazarus, who was filming, and another guy, Greg Skomel, who's this shark guy. And they were like, there's a great white shark in here. And it's this pool. It's like a, it's a place where kids go swimming. There's a, you know, there's these long, narrow channels that go between Hadley's Harbor and Lackey's. And sometimes they're so narrow that you can barely get a boat through them. And when the tide is running through there, there's actually a, a tilt in the ocean. I mean, you can see the water with the high tide coming and it's like going down, downstream. And kids sometimes jump off that little bridge and hang on with a rope because it's like you can almost water ski off of it when it's, the tide's going. And then it opens up to this kind of pool, kind of me then closes back down into a creek and meanders out into Lackey's. And I had just been swimming there with my, at the time, like two-year-old kid the weekend before. And so we go coasting into this kind of pool, this big eddy, um, and you know, it's beautiful September day, that just glassy calm, and all of a sudden this fin comes up out of the water. And, he's, and these guys are like, you, you wait till you see this thing, you won't believe how big it is. So we were sort of prepared. <clears throat> and this thing swam by, and its back was like three feet wide, or two and a half feet wide, it was huge. And it came up under the surface, and it was, and it was sort of this brownish gray. And it, and it would come up, and its fin would break the surface. The fin was like 18 inches tall. But the creepiest thing was, it would then go down again, and when it got to about a foot underwater, it just was gone. It disappeared. It was the coloration between the color of the shark and the kind of the murkiness of the water. It blended so well that it, this giant thing would come up, and it would go down and then the water would just smooth over and it looked like the most inviting place you wanted to go swimming. So we were all sort of awestruck and, and, and Greg had speared it with a, uh, this, some very expensive tag. And, uh, and so we watched it for a long time and in fact at one point we let the boat drift over kind of near the shore so we could 
you know, watch it go. And it actually came up and it tried to swim between the shore and our boat and realized that it was too shallow. And so it sort of stalled and got stuck right next to the boat for a moment. And it was sort of trying to get itself to veer off. And it was just basically sliding along the edge of the boat. So Adam has this video of me where I ran my hand down the side of the shark and I touched it as it was sliding by. And that video was then purchased by like Good Morning America or something. And it was broadcast all over you know, morning television on one of the networks. And I was waiting to hear people say, you know, this is, this is why they, they have to, you know, barricade these, you know, things off because here's somebody abusing and, you know, messing with this fish. And, uh, you know, but I thought of it more like, uh, number one, it wouldn't hurt it. And number two, there's probably very few times where a human and a great white can have physical contact without one of the two uh, coming out worse though for the wear. But that, and so then that was this big story here for several weeks where this shark they realized it had been trapped in this pool and uh, it couldn't get out. It couldn't. My theory is that it came from the Hadley side and tried to get all the way to Lackey's. This long convoluted way. Realized it was too shallow for it to make that last little step to get out back to sea, but couldn't quite figure out how it got there in the first place and so it just stayed there. And uh, it became this sort of national sensation. I mean there were helicopters flying overhead, and it was on the national news. People were taking tourists out in their boats, you know, and having them pay 150 bucks or something to go out. And then and the state had cordoned it off so that you couldn't um, uh, get in there, but people could kind of peek over. And eventually they pushed it out, so. Um, but I showed up at this, uh, at this informatics meeting that, that afternoon up at Hui. And I was 20 minutes late, and I said, I'm 20 minutes late, but you won't believe why I'm late. I guarantee you no one's told you this one before. And I said, I'm late because I was touching this great white shark <laughs> in Lackey's. And, now, and the thing is now, I, uh, when I go swimming here in Woods Hole, I've been sort of ruined because I, now I know that, in fact, all the times that I've gone swimming out in deep water and told myself, oh, it's okay, because there's really probably no big sharks around here. Well, now I know differently. And I say, I tell people every time I go swimming now, I see that shark. It's always just on the, just beyond where I can see, but I know it's there. <laughs>
And when it first, the first time it happens, you think something's really gone wrong, like you're having some kind of, you know, heart attack or something. And uh, this was the, really the first time it happened to me. And what I had done was I had taken all the air out of my BC so that I would sink to the bottom really fast, because my idea was to go down, get them fast, and come back up. So I just jumped down, plunged like a stone to the bottom. And when I got to the bottom, I was like, <laughs> and I, and I really freaked me out. So uh, I come rocketing back to the surface as fast as, I mean, it wasn't very deep, it was like 15 feet deep, but I come up to the surface, you know, really thinking something was wrong with me. And as I came up, I came up so fast and I was under the dock. And when I came up, I hit the, my, my mask, smashed into the bottom of the dock and really kind of punched my nose. So I got a bloody nose. So I push myself back underneath and I come to the surface to, and, and Malcolm, <laughs> he sees all these bubbles and he sees me coming up. So he's like right there to grab all the things out of my hand. And, he, and this look of complete terror comes over his face because he said, <clears throat> he said, all of a sudden I just erupted out of these bubbles and my whole upper body was like purple and I had blood coming out of my nose and he thought I had like embolized or something down there. He was ready to like give me CPR or something. <laughs> But it was just, uh, yeah, because obviously, you know, just fight, fighting the cold. But what I, so he was really freaked out for a few moments, but um, we didn't, I didn't end up collecting those anemones. So Eddie Enos and Gene Tassinari were sort of the main collector guys. And um, one of the two would usually drive the boat um, when we would collect clams off of Martha's Vineyard, off of Menemsha. That's where we would go to collect spicula, and spicula were really hot when I was in college, and that's what Joan Ruderman worked on, and that's basically what got the M MRC paid for, or at least uh, started. And um, <clears throat> we would go down the vineyard, and where we would, we would collect off Menemsha, it was this big sandbar, and and it wasn't very deep. It might be 10 or 12 feet deep where we would go, but there was always this really big current ripping through there one direction or another. So the first thing we would do is we would pull into Menemsha Harbor, and there's like a, there's sort of, it's not a town, but there's like a boat stop, and the fishing boats are there, and there's, um, you know, fish, uh, fish shops, and um, a place you can get coffee and bait, kind of, you know, and we would have a coffee there. And then we would um, go diving over there. And it was really neat because even though sandbars seem fairly um, not very diverse, in fact, there's lots of things that live there and a lot of things under the sand. And for the specialty, you have to um, go over the sand and you're looking for this indentation, which is where the clam siphons are just under the surface. And we would take a knife and pop them out. And um, every year, a couple of times a year, the conditions would be just right, where we, there would be what are called salps. They're a type of um, ascidian, and they're colonial. They're like, they look like, they kind of look like a clear grape. They're about the size of a grape, and the animal, or the organs of the animal inside, look like a little grape seed, and otherwise they're clear, and they stack up into these long chains. And when they're coming through, so they're mostly transparent, and they're these long kind of undulating, undulating chains, and there's millions of them. And so you go underwater, and it, you, if you hold your arm up like this, they're really fragile. Like if you, if if a chain comes through like this, undulating, if you just go like that, it'll it'll break into two or three pieces. Um, but sometimes these chains will be like this big, and if you hold your arm up, they'll start just draping over it until it gets so heavy that you have to, you know, let it go back. And we used to call those salp storms, and. It was always, you know, it was something that would happen just once, you know, once or twice a year. You usually find them further offshore. Um, but it was always really neat diving off of, off of Menemsha. One time we were collecting there, I think like in March, and um, the Menemsha has a Coast Guard station there. And all of a sudden, we're the, and so in March, there's no boats out there. We're literally the only boat. Nobody's out. And the Coast Guard comes flying out, and they're heading over there, and all of a sudden they come, and they're coming right toward us. And we're like, oh my goodness, they're coming, they're coming to us. And they get closer and closer, and all of a sudden the boat goes, Whoa! it hits a sandbar. These guys don't even know where their sandbars are. And uh, so they're getting stuck, and they're trying to, and they finally back off. 
and then they call us on the radio and tell us to come to them. And uh, so they wanted to know what we were doing um, because some lady had seen us through her binoculars or something and she said that there were men pulling yellow bags out of the ocean because we had these yellow catch bags that we would fill with clams and we were like smugglers or something. So we showed them what we had and explained a little bit. They thought they were scallops even though they're clams that are black and are about this big. He said, is that a scallop? You Coast Guard guys need to learn a little bit about the local waters here. Malcolm Child was one of the other divers. Malcolm was here for many years. His mom is Julia Child, does the drawings. She was here for the opening. And um, he was the shipper for many years. Joe DeGeorgis started that year. He's a PI now here at MBL, studies squid. But he was a diver, 1985 started here. And Joe actually is the one who saved me from my most painful encounter with any of the marine life here in Woods Hole. And it wasn't when we were diving and it wasn't collecting animals. It was when I was reaching into a bucket to pull a clam out of a bucket, those big surf clams that we have here. They have these big muscles like this. And those muscles, all they do is hold that. They just got to close the shell. And I was, Joe was packing a bunch of these clams up to ship and then he left for a minute. So I said, I'll keep filling the box. And I was reaching in and filling the box and the clams open up when they're out of the water. And my knuckle of my finger went into the clam's shell like this. And the clam shell, you know, it's just like, like a beak. I mean, it's just like hard rock. And it clamped down on my finger. And you know, your knuckle's sort of bigger around than the opposite. So it's like, you can't pull it out. It's when it closed and it was like this vice. And it was so painful. I wouldn't have thought, you must have nerves running up the side of your finger or something because I was like, it was almost making me faint. I was getting lightheaded and I would like scream, ah, like this gagged scream. <laughs> and here I am with the complete mercy of this clam. And as long as I didn't move, like the clam would open up again, just relax a little bit. And so I'd just be sitting there like, <gasps> and then I'd try to pull it out and it would grab me again and ah. <laughs> And for like 20 minutes, I was completely paralyzed with pain from this cr clam until Joe finally came back. He was like, oh my God, what happened? He's like, kill it! <laughs> the clam's got he got me! And he came and he had a cut, he actually had to cut it off of me. Oh my God, I had this dent on my fingers for like three months and for six months, the sides of my finger were just numb. I mean, I thought I had, you know, done nerve damage or something. So it's not the sharks that'll get you around here. <laughs> it's the clams.